Hello, good afternoon. It's great to be here. Thank you for the introductions, and thank you, Dean, for the invitation to come and speak to you guys today. Uh, this is my first time in Little Rock, and so far I'm loving it. And it's a little warmer than where I've been coming from in Kansas, so that's great, too. And I also got to visit the Clinton Library earlier and had a tour, which I really liked, especially because when I started to think about politics, it was when Clinton was running for the first time. And so I remember watching the presidential debates with my dad and arguing and feeling like I should be doing something. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about my second book, like you just heard. It's called The Latino Gender Gap in U.S. Politics. And like we just saw at the State of the Union address this week and with the Republican response, we see that there's a lot more attention focused on both the potential women's vote and the potential Latinos vote. And so my interest is what's going on in the middle, especially for both and for minority women. So as both parties are trying to strategically appeal to women and Latinos, we need to know more about the diversity within each, each group. So within the women's potential vote, we talk about the modern gender gap. And with the modern gender gap, we usually look at exit poll data and we see what the proportion of men and women support usually for the winning candidate. So in 2012, the gap was about 10 points, with women being at 55% supporting President Obama compared to the men. And this was uh, at the highest point it's been since 1996, which would sound familiar because that's also when President Clinton was running for the second time. And at that time, the gender gap was at 11 points. Okay. So with this modern gender gap, we see that women are being much more supportive of the Democratic candidates than the men. Women are also voting at higher rates than the men. And they're also more supportive of more liberal public policies than the men. So that's why both parties want to know, first off, within the Democrats, how can we keep this going? Republicans, how can we change this? Unfortunately, the, the focus that we, we pay attention to with the idea of the gender gap is usually in terms of the white majority population. And I want to talk more about what's going on with the minority females. And with Latinos, we also heard how the population's growing at high rate. And they're considered important swing voters. And that's because they can influence the direction of an election. So for Latinos, they give uh, a big level of support generally to the Democratic Party, but then they can also give a small level of support to the Republicans, and this can also change depending on what part of the country we're talking about. So both parties are trying to also strategically appeal to the Latinos. But as they're trying to strategically appeal to the Latino vote, they're still not quite sure how to successfully court the Latino vote as we can see when they, they say some things like uh, self-deportation, which a lot of Latinos do not like. So they have to know what the diversity is within Latino voters and pay attention to what they say and what they're supporting in government. So that, that's a little bit about the background, about the important women's vote, important Latino vote. And now I think we're going to pay much more attention to the important minority female vote. So the modern gender gap that we hear about in the news is now actually reinforced by racial and ethnic minority women. So for the 2012 election, black women and Latina voters overwhelmingly supported President Obama. And this was by nine to 11 points. So this minority gender gap was actually greater than the gap for whites. And in, the, in, in 2012, and 2008, for the white majority, the majority of support for both the men and women was towards the Republican candidate. But the gap in terms of who was supporting the Democrats, it was about seven points. But in terms of the minority vote, the majority of support for both men and women has gone to the Democratic candidate, and the gap for the women, like I just said, is much higher than it is for the whites, as much as 11 points for Latinas. So I want to look more at why this is going on and why we need to pay more attention to what, how these gender differences can affect uh, the political participation for Latinos. 
And keeping that in mind, with the gender gap, Latinas also vote at higher rates than the men, but we need to know much more about why this is the case and how it might differ among all the different uh, diverse groups within the Latino population. So in the book, I compare the size and the direction of the Latino gender gap. I look at different Latino generations in the US. So different generations for Latinos, we're talking about first generation, uh, first to come to the US, they, weren't, they were born in another country. And then it goes second, even, well actually 1.5, 2, 2.5, third, up to the fourth generation. And fourth generation is where they have both their parents and their grandparents that were born in the US. And I also, so I also look at national origin group differences. So depending on, on where each of the Latinos can trace their national origin to their home countries in Latin America or, or Central America. And I do this by looking at some data, some national public opinion data and focus group data as well to look at some interviews that have been done with Latinos in all different um, types of cities throughout the country. So in the study, I first incorporate the idea of gender or the study of gender into the study of migration and political incorporation for Latino immigrants. So we first wanna know Latino immigrants, how are they thinking about the US? Do they want to stay in the US? Do they want to uh, become citizens? Or are they focusing a lot of their attention on their home country? Do they eventually want to go back? So it was important to look at the gender differences and to look to see how Latinas are thinking about being in the US if they're new immigrants. And I also examine then Latino political behavior and look at the gender differences for the last three presidential elections. So we're talking about 2004, 2008, and 2012. So what are some of the findings? I'll talk about that today. First off, I see that Latinas are actually socialized to have more civic skills than Latino males. So they're, they're brought up very differently than the men. Uh, I see some of this with some of previous uh, qualitative work that's been done with interviews with Latino families, as well as some of the focus group data that I looked at. The women are sort of told you, you need to be thinking about how you can help the family and, and maybe not necessarily go outside the home as much, help us take care of the family. Guys, maybe you guys can run around, we're not gonna pay as much attention to what you're doing. And as Latinas are socialized a bit differently, they're starting to think about their new responsibilities, their increased roles in the household. Um, they also might need to even just do things like uh, help the parents with translation if it's a new immigrant family. So as they're doing this, Latinas start to get more civic skills than the men. And they also start to become more involved in their communities. And I just mentioned increased responsibility within the family. So as they're doing this, Latinas are actually getting more motivated to get involved in community work to help their uh, Latino population as well as their families specifically. And they're especially motivated to get involved in their communities when it's an issue of importance that's at stake. You know, for instance, it might be an issue of importance of trying to get more Latinos through the educational system. Yeah. And Latinas are likely to take the initiative and personally organize their communities and become leaders in some of these movements and organizations. Also, I see that Latinas are also serving this mediating role between political parties and groups. So as Latinas are getting more active in their communities and trying to help their families' interests, they are also uh, tapping several different networks and they're showing that they can be a key uh, connection with the Latino community towards governmental institutions and political parties. And as Latinas serve as these key mediating roles, they're also then targeted to think about uh, getting campaign and candidate training. So these Latinas are also asked, hey, you're doing such a great job getting involved in your community. We actually know you, we're talking to you uh, to help political parties and organizations. I think you would be perfect to run for political office. So we're actually seeing this much more often as well. And as Latinas are getting much more involved in their communities, they're also, that, that's also linking them to a higher political participation rates. 
So Latinas also participate in politics uh, at much higher rates than the men do. And they have more attention towards US politics, not necessarily focusing on their home countries. So what does that mean in terms of what happens with Latino modern gender gap? So in terms of immigrant behavior, so among Latino immigrants, Latinas are less tied to their country of origin. They still have a strong identity, feel uh, close to their country of origin, but they don't necessarily have to focus all of their attention, their money, their political attention or time towards their home country. And so actually Latinas are much more likely than the Latino male immigrants to want to think about making a life in the US and making it as best as possible, which includes uh, becoming a citizen. So with Latinas, they have higher naturalization rates. They become citizens at higher rates than the Latino males. So they want to stay in the US. They want to do what's best uh, for their family. And then I also look at uh, different public opinion attitudes. I look in the book of, about gender issues, which we hear a lot about right now, both sides of the issue. I look at the level of government income support, as well as whether Latinos feel that uh, the Affordable Care Act should be uh, held as law or whether it should be repealed. And I also look at immigration-related policies, which again are becoming much more uh, salient right now in politics. And overall, Latinos as a whole support much more liberal views on some of these public policies. And there isn't a big difference between different generations of Latinos or among the men and the women. And for Latinas, it's just in some of the later generations, they're a little bit more liberal than the guys. But it's not a huge difference. Okay, so I found that to be pretty interesting. And then, the part, the part that political parties might want to pay most attention to is the idea of Latinos identifying with the political parties and what Latinos' political ideology is. And overall, uh, some newer research has shown that some immigrant-based groups like Latinos and Asians are not identifying as often with political parties as they did before. So there's declining partisanship. And this does not bode well for political parties. If we, can, if we think about uh, the increasing Asian and Latino population that don't want to identify with a political party. Okay. But I found within the ones that actually do take time and want to identify with the party, the Latinas are actually more supportive of a democratic or more liberal political ideology and much more supportive of the Democratic Party than Latino males. And what's interesting is that this also depends on the generational status that we're looking at. So there's, it's called a Latina, basically a realignment in political ideology. So if we're looking at first generation Latinos, the Latinas may be a little bit more supportive of a conservative ideology than the men. But as we look at Latinas in later generations, they're much more supportive of the democratic or liberal political ideology than the men. So this is where that modern gender gap comes into play and we really see Latinas showing much more support for the Democrats. And what's important in this uh, previous elections and in the upcoming elections is how this is going to translate into electoral support for both the Democrats and the Republicans. And lastly in the book, I also look at strategic mobilization. So once we find out more about how Latinos feel about public policies, how they feel about the parties, whether they get active in politics or not, we then have to see what the campaign's response is gonna be from both of the parties. And so as we've seen in the last uh, several presidential elections, the campaigns focus on battleground states. So we hear this important battleground state idea in that the campaigns are gonna devote most of their effort towards those key swing states. And unfortunately, most of us don't live in those key swing states. Uh, I'm sure, Arkan like Arkansas, like Kansas, we don't see a lot of the action. But we wanna know what's going on in those, in those important swing states. And I see that for Latinos, they're much more likely to get 
contacted by a political party and get asked to go out and vote if they are in a battleground state than if they were in a uh, more of a uh, safe state. Okay. But what's interesting is that the Latino population is actually the highest in the so-called safe states, like Texas, like California, but it's actually growing at, at a very high rate in some of these battleground states. So this is, is definitely gonna be important when we look at the next coming elections, because we're gonna see that this growing Latino population in these swing states are gonna be able to provide the uh, margin of support, margin of victory, sorry, for who's gonna win in each of these states. Because their growing population might not be that big, but the actual difference between uh, the election is not that big as well. So the Latinos that participate could make the difference in who's gonna get elected. And what's interesting is there's also a gender dynamic in this party contact and mobilization. So what's interesting is that the political parties are actually contacting Latinos differently based on their gender and based on whether the state is a battleground state or not. So for example, the Democratic Party, it seems that they are contacting the Latinas more than the males in the battleground states than in the safe states. But they have a high level of contact towards Latino males, regardless of whether it's a safe state or not. So they're pretty consistently contacting the males, but think about the Latinas when it comes time to the battleground states. Okay. And then for, to compare this, the, the Republican Party have more levels of contact towards the Latino males in the battleground states than in the safe states, but a consistently low effort to contact the Latinas in any of the states. Okay. So they are, they're not actually thinking what can we do to try to, to get Latinas involved and help our cause. So this could prove to be pretty important, especially when we're thinking about the fact that Latinas uh, are participating at, at very high rates and they tend to right now be more supportive of the Democratic Party. So I think I still have some time. I'm just gonna talk about what some more political implica implications, sorry, hard word for me to say, implications can be for the future. So I think that this, this future uh, of uh, U.S. politics definitely is going to uh, be determined by what happens with minorities and with women, especially with minority women. Excuse me. So first off, in terms of the mobilization of Latinos. So we tend to hear in the news right now about the, the potential of Latinos to influence uh, the vote but the fact that there's so many Latinos that are actually not actually citizens, so they can't vote, or they haven't registered to vote because they are not interested in voting, or they might ha not be identifying with the parties, so they don't want to vote. But a lot of political organizations right now are trying to figure out how do we tap at that potential of all of those Latinos that could become citizens and could actually vote in the elections. And so what's interesting is that these organizations are actually devising Latina strategies. So for instance, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, NALEO, has started a Latina strategy. And their focus is on Latinas to try to get at getting the naturalization efforts, getting more Latinos to become citizens, and to get them out to vote. And so they're doing this because some of their focus group findings actually shows that Latinas are often the most influential family members in convincing persistent non-participating Latinos to vote. So what that essentially means is Latinas are telling their family, get up, go out, vote. And with some of the focus group research that I looked at, the Latinas are actually the ones that are telling their Latino males, actually go and become a citizen. Here's the paperwork, go do it. And once you become a citizen, go get active in the community and vote. Okay? So if you can tap at the, those Latinas that are getting very active, telling their family members to go out and vote, that this could help Latinos as a whole 
um, with their naturalization efforts and for the get out the vote effort. So what's interesting is that Latinas are actually perceived to be the key to mobilizing Latino families and the communities. And I think even when I was talking to some of the Clinton School students earlier, they were also noticing that any of the um, organizations that they've been involved in, they're noticing that it's the Latinas that are always there, that are showing up, that are getting active, and we've seen this throughout history. Okay. One more thing about the political implications is what this means also to try to get more Latinos elected to office. And so some organizations are also starting the Latina strategy to get more Latinas elected to office. So for instance, it's called the Latinas Represent Project, and it is a coalition of various groups. For the most part, it's who started is called Political Parity and the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda. And I'm on their national advisory board because of the first book, but trying to just tell them what, why do we need to think about getting more Latinas elected to office? And so they see what the number is. The Latina rate of electoral office holding is very low compared to other women. But if we look at the Latinas within the Latino delegation, their percentage is higher than if we just look at white women with all the white men that are elected. So even though Latinas are not at an elected at a very high rate, they're becoming much more successful. So this Latinas Represent project is actually focusing on how to advance that, how to get even more Latinas elected to office. So they've done research, they've talked to uh, organizations, elected officials throughout the country, and they're going to unlaunch, unlaunch, launch sorry, their data next week in Denver and then they're gonna be going to a couple of other big cities to talk about what can we do to help get Latinas elected to office. In addition, there's also several groups that are starting Latina PACs, or political action committees. And that is because Latinas themselves are seeing we, how they can help Latina elected officials or potential candidates to office. And so they're starting PACs by Latinas for Latinas. And there's a big one in Texas called Latina List, and there's one nationally that's called Poder PAC. And these are becoming much more active in both working with the Latino community and trying to help provide some training, some, some support, some financial contributions to try to help get more Latinas elected to office. Okay. And I think that's all the notes, at least, I had. I think I went a little bit fast, but I just get so excited about uh, all this potential to talk about Latinas, especially because I've just been doing all this work on my own, and now I get to see it in action. So I, I love to be here, and uh, I'm so glad to share this with you today. Well, she knows her stuff. And for those that are thinking about, and I know somebody else that knows their stuff that just raised her hand right here, that thinking about uh, the implications of 2016, uh, at these are uh, interesting times. Yes, right here, Suzanne. Let's go wait for the microphone. That we'll... Hi there. Thanks for coming. Okay. Appreciate your talk. Uh, Susana O'Daniel. Um, I just wanted you to comment on the role of Susana Martinez in the national debate and um, just kind of her rhetoric and okay. opposition to maybe some of the comments you made here, whether she's an outlier or represents something larger. Okay, interesting. So with the potential impact of Latino vote, we're also seeing how Latinos are being um, sort of pushed to the forefront for both political parties, especially during the primary and the um, uh, conventions. But so we're seeing several Latinos, especially Latinas, Susana Martinez, the governor of New Mexico, who was pushed to the forefront to take a more active effort. She was also uh, possibly going to be tapped for a vice presidential uh, choice for Romney. But unfortunately, she also noticed, and some Latino organizations noticed, that she wasn't really um, pushed to the forefront as much. So especially like during the convention time, she didn't get like the key speak speaking slot. So it, it might be because she doesn't have views that are strictly in line with what the Republicans are saying. 
So they saw she wasn't really going to be a good fit with Romney, but this might not be this might be the case where she maybe she's a better fit for the next candidate. Um, I wouldn't necessarily see her as the top of the, the the list, but she's definitely one that that the party wants and should focus much more on. Does that answer your question? Okay. Question right back here. Yes, ma'am. If the right, right, right back there. Sometimes national issues seem at quite a distance from daily life. Uh, how, would you say something about how local issues drive Latinos to be active? Yes, that's very good. So the Latinas have the history of getting involved in their community because it's an issue of importance at stake, which we usually see that those local issues. It's something that's going to be able to get them active and, and drive them and motivate them to get involved. Uh, I think what political parties are actually able to do and some national organizations is that they have to then be able to translate how those local issues apply nationally. Uh, so for Latinas, they sort of, uh, like a while ago, they had to be talked into running for office, even at a lower level, because they had to be told how you could actually have a benefit in running for office, because they actually saw that working in their communities was the best way to, to do it to focus on those local issues, to, to see something being done. And they had to sort of be, be coaxed into thinking about how you could actually have influence when you're an elected official, and then even thinking about going higher. So for, for Latinas, especially at least with the previous history we've seen, they sort of have to be talked into knowing why they have to expand their scope, because they're so interested and motivated in, in those local issues. We've got lots of questions. Yes, ma'am, right here. We'll, we'll, we'll get to them. See, I told you, Christina, you, you, you know, you're a rock star. <laughs> Hi, my Hello. name is Maria Baez de Hicks, and I'm a district chair for the Arkansas Democratic Hispanic Caucus. So okay, when I saw you on the list, I was like, I have to come. <laughs> um, my main question is, who is doing it right? Who is doing the outreach? Who is doing the conversion correctly so that we can replicate it here? That is going to probably be the third book. So, <laughs> so I, I was just sort of hinting. So what I, I've looked at in, in my research, and sort of, I've sort of got interested in studying politics because I was very active, or at least tried to be in Texas as well, so uh, where I'm from. So right now it's also seen how that, that's being applied as far as what we know about the Latino population, especially the women, how that's actually getting implemented and applied by organizations and by political parties. So I'm actually finally just getting to that step. So it would be hard to then tell you, okay, this is what everybody's doing and whether they're doing it right or wrong. But at least we know, based on the data that we have, that both parties and a lot of organ well, organizations are actually doing a better job at trying to mobilize Latinos to both become citizens and, and vote than the political parties themselves because they have to think about so many different interests and trying to balance all of that um, because they don't want to, they want to get some people happy and not everybody angry and so they have to, to do a pretty big balancing act. And so at least with that, I, I want to focus much more on what's actually being done to get the Latinos organized. But I don't know yes, specifics right here in the, yet. <laughs> maybe in the blue. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, doctor. Hello. Texan? Yes. So am I. Good. <laughs> I had the great pleasure of meeting uh, Governor Susana Martinez, uh, very uh, impressed with her record. Mm -hmm. uh, security guard at age 17. Really? Carried a weapon. Her father, former Marine, was a Democrat mm -hmm. and was approached and went on and ran the Republican ticket. I'm the oddball here. I'm a conservative Latino, you know, and uh, you're right. I come from the old school, Brownsville, Texas, where my grandmother was involved in politics. And it was very difficult uh, at that time, back in the 50s, the Jim Crow laws and so on and so on. Yes. I understand when you mentioned the Latinas getting up in the forefront, and I hope that more do participate. I, I do want my daughter to be actively politically, but I think sometimes the machismo, mm -hmm. sometimes the inner family do not encourage the women to go out and be more active politically. And I was talking to Michelle here, you mentioned that sometimes the social uh, activism by women and males are not really too concerned is because the males are working mm -hmm. and so they don't want to get involved in that. Right. Is that something maybe that, that is there where 
the women is at home with the children and then the males are working and you know. Right, that's part of it. And women are also getting socialized a little bit differently or thinking about their gender roles a bit differently. Uh, also as they become more active in the workforce. So both when they're in the home, they're thinking about what's in the best interest of my family and my community and they may have more time to get involved. And then the, the women that are out working outside of the workforce, they're starting to think about taking a much more active role in other realms, the, the public realm, and getting involved in politics because they're out there in the workforce now. Uh, so at least there, there's still the idea of machismo, so Latinas still have to sort of fight that as well, but even within Texas, um, some of the political action committees and some of the work by some of the, the groups in Texas are actually seeing that, well, we're not getting, the Latinas themselves aren't getting as much support to run for office as we would like. So that's why they're trying to start these political action committees by Latinas for Latinas. Yeah. So actually be able to get on the ground and help some of these Latinas. And then Texas, there's also the interesting case uh, where we have a female ticket that's running for governor and lieutenant governor for the Democratic Party. So Wendy Davis, who got a lot of attention um, when over the summer uh, of what she did in the Senate with her filibuster, she's running for governor for the Democratic Party. And then the lieutenant governor candidate is uh, Letitia Vandepute, and she's a Latina that's been in the Texas Senate for a long time. And so both of them are running, and it's just going to be so interesting to see how the Democratic Party and all the different organizations are trying to get more of the women and Latinos especially getting involved and, and seeing if they could turn Texas blue, potentially. Now let's just go ahead because we've got other, other questions. We'll get... Yeah. Okay. All right. Michelle, you've got a question right here. You're speaking, uh, you, you, you said you're going to write a third book. Well, with uh, yesterday's Republican principles coming out for immigration reform right. and the movement from the Democrats to have an immigration reform, if it passes, and we all hope it passes, how do you see all this voting, participation, mobilization change if uh, a reform passes before, the 24th, uh, before November? Okay. Well, it's going to be very interesting to see whether we're going to see this, this broad or uh, significant gender gap within the Latino population where they're more supportive of the Democrats, even if the Republican Party comes up with some sort of policy on immigration reform that might appeal to them. So we, it would be interesting to see what's going to happen. It's hard for me to say exactly what I think, but I'm going to love seeing, seeing it in play and seeing it all happen. And I would love to see how this is going to play out and, and how the parties are going to actually think about their strategy. And hopefully they'll think about their strategy and how, trying to appeal to the most amount of people. Yeah. Uh, one more question right back here. And I would encourage everybody just to ask a question so everybody can have time to get there. Hello, my name is Ramirez Biddle. I'm a Clinton School student, class nine, and thank you for being here. Uh, my, I have just two quick questions. Uh, question one is that Latinos and African Americans in Arkansas are forming these uh, political alliances. And I was wondering how important will that be coming in the next four to eight years to, to finally see a minority get elected to statewide office in Arkansas because mm -hmm. we've never had that happen before. And also, I would like for you to kind of highlight some of the tactics that were used to get Latinos elected into office because in Arkansas, I only know of one Latino that was successful in achieving elective office, my good friend Jorge uh, Garcia down in Hot Springs. Okay. So I think I'll take the first part of that first. So um, the coalitions between various racial and ethnic groups are very important. And at least what I've been able to see is that for minority women, they're actually trying to, they're getting some more uh, political success getting elected to office because they could also tap at more of these possible coalitions. So with the first book, I talk a little bit about how minority women are, can appeal more to more women because they share that identity. They can also appeal to more racial and ethnic groups, including minority men, because they also share that racial and ethnic identity. And so I, I think that could be the key to trying to get more Latinos elected to office, even if we're thinking about 
uh, the, the state of Arkansas or some other places in, in the country is to also especially be able to tap at these minority women who can get more possible coalitions to get elected. I hope I answered that. Okay. Well, let me just say, Christina, you're awesome. Thank you're you. doing great work. <laughs> Mark my words that in 2016 and 2020, she'll probably be on CNN analyzing elections for people and what happened. We're honored to have you at the Clinton School. Thank you for being here very much. Thank you.